We just had the Round Brown series in September, and um, one of the whole focus of the Round Brown series were recommendations for the, uh, to the administration, to the Africa Union, and most importantly to the African diaspora. What are the recommendations going forward? I've always felt that you got to come out of a conference with something. And uh, one thing we tasked our panel with um, is really to come up with specific recommendations that we can make um, that can that CFA can use advocacy going forward. And so I wanted to give them a chance, a brief chance, to, uh, to outline what they came up with. Uh, we're going to start out with the uh, uh, peace and security, and General uh, Kip Ward is going to report. Well, good morning, everyone. That's the, it is still morning, and uh, thanks to uh, the, uh, the Institute of African Studies here, as well as the Constituency of Africa, for inviting me to come back and provide some very brief comments on a very lively discussion that we had about a month and a half ago when it comes to peace and security on the continent of Africa. Obviously, uh, in the time that Mel gave me, and he's going to be the hook man, so I can't <laughs> go over all of that in any detail, but let me hit a couple of high points that may be food for thought for each of us as we look at this notion of peace and security in Africa and how we can get at it more effectively. Let me begin by saying that peace and security in Africa is not a military matter. The military efforts can help facilitate, but lest anyone think that it is a military matter, then we're on the wrong railroad. And so I say that to say that the focus that we sometimes place on the importance of the force of arms to create peace and security leads us down the wrong path. Now, as a, as a, as a 40-year soldier, you say, wow, why is that guy saying that? Well, I say it because I am a 40-year soldier, having been in places where I saw that that in and of itself does not lead to what we want to have established when it comes to creating stability anywhere to include the continent of Africa and its island nations. And so when I commanded AFRICOM, I was asked, well, what are your objectives for your command in Africa? And I'm sure folks wanted to hear me say, well, I want to have 88 battalions, 49 squadrons. I want to have this and that, the force of arms, and we're just going to go and dominate. Absolutely not. We didn't say that. We didn't do that. And I think because of that, the inroads that we were able to make when it came to creating at least a movement towards stability were positive ones. Now, would I like to see more of it? To be sure. And this is where I think our group, when we talked about peace and security, these other things that take place. Now, let's be clear. There are some folk that need to be made to go away. <laughs> Don't name names. Don't name names. But having said that, to create long-term stability, we need other things in place that will lead to that. And ironically, many of them have been discussed here. When it comes to this notion that we created partnering for stability, and how do you as a entity, an organization, an individual that has a more stable African continent in the square center of what you want to see, how is that impacted by what we can do when it comes to this notion of security and peace? We here in the United States of America, as well as other parts of the world, just finished celebrating, we call it Veterans Day here. I spoke at three different locations yesterday about the importance of Veterans Day. And my lead off statement to include that some of our elementary, a couple of our elementary schools was that the armed forces of the United States of America serves its people. Serves its people, first and foremost. And if that's not the case, then it needs to be something going on in a different way. No less true for Kip Ward's opinion armed forces of any nation. How does that force serve its people? For us, that mission is rooted in our Constitution. Not an individual, not in some ideologue, but our Constitution, the people's document. And so when we build a, an approach to peace and security in Africa, and if you look at the armed forces, 
then how is that construct such that it is working as a force for good for the people? Where young four or five year old kids, babies, when they see a soldier, a sailor in uniform, they see someone who is their protector and not their oppressor. These things that we've spoken to with respect to economic development, good governance, terms that I use, you will recall how we focus on, during those days we talked about the three Ds, development, economic growth. I use the term diplomacy, but it's governance, good governance, effective governance, at least more rather than less. And then obviously security, because you need an environment where these things can go on. So there's clearly a place for that. And then how do you use those things that are, are called your security force to help promote it all? First, working for its people. And so you have reforms that you can put in place, I think, that include the integration of women, because gender is a critical component in the society, taking advantage of all your resources to elevate the people. It is how you educate your people so that they can contribute in ways that causes that society in which they live to be a place where they want to stay and be. It is their health. About a month and a half ago, I was out in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa, speaking to, to the World Food Prize, talking about the importance of food when it comes to security. And so as we look at those various things, and it comes to the security apparatus in a nation, it's armed forces. Well, how is that armed forces contributing to all of this? And believe you me, it's not just because you see a soldier carrying a gun or an airplane that can drop a missile, but it is because of the example and how that entity can be used as a force for good in that society to elevate its citizenry. To be sure, being a protector is their number one priority mission, but they also can be an example. For example, various programs, be they training missions, our military to military programs that you have, many of these Countries have, well, we know about corruption, and we know about under-the-table activities. <laughs> How we take that off the table as something that we want to create behavior that most of the people in those countries want to have. Take the threat away that a soldier will be forced to go and loot a village because his military apparatus isn't paying him or her. So how do we cause those things that we do to help influence these other things in society? Because let's face it, in most of these nations, that force still has some gravitas, still has some mm, about it. I oftentimes just say, well, I walk into a room now, and, oh, General, you, you, I didn't recognize you. Yeah, I don't have my uniform on. So that uniform kind of is like a magnet or something. I don't know what it was. But that's, that's no less true in other places. But how do we take advantage of that with respect to how behavior, how the attitudes, and how the things that are important to elevate a society can be better realized? And then causing the sorts of reforms to exist in these militaries such as what went on, we talked about Liberia. Linda's gone now, but when she was there as ambassador, with, and speaking with Ambassador Correction with, with President uh, Sirleaf, and she says to me, General, I need you to help me to build an army that does what you just said, work for my people. And so as opposed to her standing up a jet fighter squadron or some other sort of activity, Help me to build an engineer element so that as I look to help my infrastructure, that can be used for, for those things so that my people can see their soldiers are working for them. And we have a national, and I, I'll, I'll stop because he's going to give me the hook in a minute, but we have a National Guard close, structure. Close. <laughs> that National Guard structure is something that has great utility because of how it can transfer its military to civilian relationships and roles in a more transparent way. There are things that we can do that will cause whatever relationships we have, 
And to be sure, I heard the term relationships, critically important. We must build relationships. We must invest in that over time, such that through the good and through the not so good, our partners and friends know that we can be counted on and we will move forward. Partnering for stability, peace and security, not the only domain of security forces. Security forces help create the, the space for these things that we've spoken to here to take effect. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, uh, General. If you wasn't a general, I might have done something. But I, said, <laughs> I better back off. You know, I want to now move to Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Bonnie is a member of the CFA Board of Directors. who's going to talk about the health care challenge in Africa. Ambassador. Thanks, Mel. Um, I'm just going to briefly review um, what the goal of the um, the uh, African Healthcare Infrastructure Committee is of CFA, and talk a little bit about um, the event that we had on September 18th. Um, and uh, just some of the just highlights of the discussion because we don't have time to do much more than that. Um, the uh, the African Healthcare Infrastructure Committee, which is part of uh, CFA, um, its mission is to organize impacted stakeholders in the United States, Africa, and throughout the diaspora to collaborate, develop, and promote initiatives that increase efficiency in health systems. It will strengthen the effectiveness of healthcare infrastructure and the pipeline for human resources for health on the African continent. It has five basic objectives, two of which I think are relevant to our discussion that we had in September, uh, to examine the health status and healthcare infrastructure of Sub-Saharan Africa, and to also look at the political and policy framework of the healthcare system. Uh, we had a very good discussion on the 18th. Uh, some of the uh, participants at that uh, event included uh, Donna Christensen, member of the uh, HIC and former member of the U.S. House of Representatives, and she's here today um, over there, and that, if she has anything to add to some of the results that I'm going to go through, I'm happy to have her do that. Um, Dr. Jed Dianelli, director of HIV, TB, STIs, and Hep Hepatitis Unit Pan-African uh, Health Organization, Dr. Ogu, president of Bond Science. Uh, Ms. Talsi Suede, co-founder and CEO of Childbirth Survival International. Wilfred uh, Ningua from Harvard Institute of Medicine. Ambassador Thelma Philip Brown, ambassador of St. Kitts and Nevis to the United States, and she's uh, here as well. So happy to have you comment also uh, from uh, after I do my uh, uh, review. And Brian Smedley, executive director and co-founder of National Collaborative for Health Equity. This event was, this particular discussion was uh, co-sponsored uh, with AHIC, but also with um, Childbirth Survivor International that I mentioned, and also Women of Color Advance in Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation. Um, some of the uh, things that came from the, from the discussion. Uh, we discovered that um, the conversation that we had was very, was actually ideal uh, for our discussion. Uh, we wanted to look at the issue of uh, access to healthcare and challenges to engaging the diaspora in addressing health, health, the health challenges in Africa. And we want to look at an issue that would affect, that we're not talking about just the, the Africans and the, and the, on the continent, but also challenges of the diaspora in other parts of the world. And uh, we've realized from that discussion that healthcare is uh, really an issue uh, for all Africans uh, and, and the diaspora. And that, of course, um, with, there are challenges around the globe, uh, including in the U.S., where we've witnessed recently some of the attacks on access to health care uh, uh, that attacks the most vulnerable, even in the United States. So really, access to health care is, is something that we care about, not just on the uh, in the African continent, but also the diaspora uh, around the world. We did not have someone on the panel who looks at Europe. Um, in terms of the diaspora there, but from discussions that I've had with many people uh, who are uh, uh, diaspora in Europe, they also have many challenges there as well in terms of access to health care. Um, these concerns about access to health care are both for communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, regarding infectious disease, for example, we are witnessing right now some of the concerns about access to health care in the DRC uh, dealing with the Ebola crisis that's going on 
and the difficulty of access uh, result as a result of internal uh, strife that's going on and the problems it's creating for people up outside the region to provide adequate health care, uh, particularly regarding, I think you've read about the CDC, which is not really going in to the country like we normally do. Um, so that's one aspect of health care and access uh, for some of the diseases. We also spend a lot of time talking about cancer. Um, and the fact that uh, cancer is an increasing concern um, and um, our focus on women and girls, we talked a lot about cervical cancer and cancer there and uh, some of the issues about, uh, about health, access to health care regarding cancer. Some of the other things that came out from the discussion uh, is that the recognition that good health care cannot be achieved without improving the social economic environment in which people live, both uh, here in the U.S., the Caribbean, but and also in Africa. Um, and that we realize we can best combat diseases where countries have appropriate measures in terms of hygiene, clean water, and other basic needs. And that finances, uh, countries' finances should be uh, encouraged to meet these basic needs. We also recognize that collaboration across, across countries is important to improve access to health care uh, for both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, we talked about in, in regarding AIDS and the CARICOM has brought all governments together in support of a planning and implementation process that has resulted in lowering the prevalence of HIV from around 3% to under 1% um, in that region because of the ability of countries to work together. Regarding non-communicable disease, the point was raised that the problems of the West are becoming problems in Africa. 80 to 90% of diseases such as diabetes and health, heart disease and strokes and even dementia are related to lifestyle. Uh, we have in the West a social economic system that creates a lifestyle that produces these type of diseases. We have a healthcare system that is not a healthcare system, but it's a disease care system that is focused on prevention and not on maximizing health. Uh, the same so so socioeconomic factors that operate in the West are exported to Africa with the same trans fat and high fructose corn syrups. And Africa has a, a uh, ability to uh, deal with some of these issues, but uh, we're burdening Africa uh, with some of our lifestyle issues that are being exported and that uh, we do not need to be going down that road in Africa. So future areas of work, we want to continue to focus on access to health care. We want to look at the issues of prevention rather than just dealing with response, uh, highlighting the issue of cancer, um, and also trying to find other partners who want to work with us on those issues. Um, so uh, during, a, during the question and answer, uh, answer period, uh, I'm happy to have others who are part of that discussion to also weigh in. So thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let's move now to the Next Generation Leadership recommendations. And we have uh, Denise Laurent Mati Mati, who's a, uh, a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department. And we have Ismira e. H., who's a Legislative Assistant for Congresswoman Gwen Moore uh, from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Mel, for having us, um, and thank you all um, for attending. Um, I'll just sort of briefly talk about some of the recommendations that were brought up in the Ron Brown series, which mainly was a follow-up to the African Diaspora Young Leaders Summit we hosted on August 3rd um, of this year with the State Department, uh, CFA, U.S. African Development Foundation, and also the African Union Mission here in Washington, D.C. Um, so that summit was the first of its kind uh, that was held uh, in D.C. by um, the various partners. And it was pretty much um, a forum or a summit to bring together some of our um, Young Africa Leaders Initiative Fellows, our Yali Fellows, and partner them with some of their counterparts here in the diaspora. Um, you know, Yali has been going on for some time now, uh, hosted by the State Department, and um, for the Africa Bureau, certainly engaging and harnessing the youth bulge in Africa is one of our major priorities. And so we have, um, you know, definitely have an interest in seeing Yali continue for the foreseeable future. And we're now at a place where we're looking at ways to sort of expand the Yali program. And so um, by hosting this summit with the State, with State Department, CFA, and the AU and others, it was a way to basically expand on harnessing the success of Yali by having them um, you know, interact with their counterparts in the diaspora. And when we say the diaspora, it's not just you know, Africans who have migrated here to the States, but it's an inclusive definition of the, of the diaspora, meaning African Americans, Caribbean Americans, and so on and so forth. And so um, the summit was attended by almost 200 young leaders here in Washington, D.C. Um, like I said before, it was the first of its kind. And pretty much it was a, 
great time where uh, an all-day discussion where the young leaders had the opportunity to talk about sort of Africa's image. Um, as I think most of us would agree that um, Africa's youth is, you know, one of its greatest assets, particularly now with the youth bulge. And so talking about how the youth can sort of, in a sense, redefine Africa's image, talking about business leadership, and also looking at how sports and technology can drive the discourse of peace and security in, in Africa at this time. And they had the opportunity to also meet their counterparts, you know, here in the diaspora, all across the United States. Um, and I know Ismira, who was a participant, will share some of her experiences, um, which I think was quite, quite surprising. But it, um, it speaks to some of the, main, the, some of the major reasons as to why we hosted the summit, because most of the young leaders on the continent coming to the states and attending the summit didn't really realize that um, some African Americans particularly share some of the experiences that they have back on the continent. And so having a young leader from Nairobi, um, you know, meet a young leader who's from from Southside Chicago, you know, in in um, in the same technology field or in the same field, they they realize that that they actually share a lot of similarities and and there's value added in them partnering in different sectors, you know, to to promote Africa's development. And so, in that sense, it's something that um, we certainly uh, are looking to expand on, continue on, and we um, and at the Ron Brown series, we spoke about ways to fully engage um, the diaspora in terms of how we can expand the YALI program to inclusively include the diaspora in, in these discussions. And so uh, I'll have Azmira also speak about some of her experiences and, and what she thought about the summit as well. Well, good morning for the remainder of it. Good day, everyone. Thank you again, Melvin, and the whole Constituency for Africa team for inviting me here today to speak with this distinguished audience. So as Denise mentioned, uh, I did have some inter interesting experiences at the very successful YALI Summit this year. I will say my I was, I was positively impressed, absolutely blown away to see so many youth from the African continent convene and devise ways to improve Africa uh, continentally. And I'll just reflect on my uh, banquet experience, if I may, for a couple of moments. We uh, came together for a dinner, and I was seated at a table with about 15 Yali members. And as we went around introducing ourselves, it came to be that I was the only African American seated at the table. And they said, well, how do you have contact and do you have contact with the African diaspora? And <laughs> <laughs> that blew me away a bit because it was a little dissociating. I said, well, I, I am a part of the African diaspora. <laughs> And some of them shook their heads. They said, well, how do you mean? Have you been to Africa? I said, yes, several times. But it just, um, I will be honest, it, it hurt me to my soul a bit. I grew up as a Pan-African in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My great-grandfather was a Garveyite, St. Louis, Missouri. After returning from the First World War, he and his comrades had been lynched for wanting to vote. Um, and he, in the state of Missouri, were very adamant about educating black Americans that we are indeed Africans, and we need to embrace that identity, be proud of it, harmonize ourselves with those on the continent, and with the story of Garveyism, had plans to actually return to Africa in the country we know now as Liberia. No, it was Liberia then. And so it was a very... Uh, inconvenient time to explain that <laughs> at a festive dinner, but you know it brought the opportunity to to educate these leaders of expanding their definition of what diaspora means. That it is not just those Africans born on the continent, but it includes those in in Europe, in the U.S., all of the Americas. Throughout Asia, I mean, we are all over. And we need to re-examine our history, reteach our history of um, what exactly the diaspora means so that it's all encompassing. So I, I very much would like to associate myself with the comments of Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield that we need 
a radical curriculum infusion of that broader definition of what the uh, diaspora is at the primary, secondary level, a, a standardization of the definition before we can really go further, I believe. So that was, um, I think, my most salient observation at, as I said, of just majestic summit. It really was wonderful, glorious. Um, and I think, I don't know how many minutes I have. You got about uh, 20 seconds. Okay. Well, since I was also asked to touch upon how we can improve uh, funding possibilities for YALI going further, as I am from the Office of Congresswoman Gwen Moore, Take as much time as you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> Since that was all about the money, which is critically important. Um, it is true that funding was decreased in previous years, and um, I, I can tell you that uh, ranking member of the African Subcommittee, Representative Karen Bass, and other members of Congress who are committed to seeing Yali's success and expansion are aiming to build YALI into a statute, okay? But until that happens, we have to work with the status quo, the system we have in place, and what's approaching now is appropriation season, programmatic request season. Uh, deadlines for that will usually are um, mid-March to early April. And so we need advocacy from the grassroots, from the grass tops, from constituents, from professionals, from everyone to speak to members of Congress to write programmatic request letters to the Appropriations Committee uh, requesting that funding for YALI be plussed up, increased. And I'll just share some names, if I may, that uh, of members of Congress that um, would be instrumental, just recommendations. On the Appropriations Committee, we have Representative Barbara Lee, Sanford Bishop, David Price. Um, he has a special interest in Africa as the ranking member, the current ranking member of the House Democracy Partnership. And he has very much vested interest in educational and exchange programs with the African continent. Uh, on foreign affairs, we have Karen Bass, of course, we know. Gregory Meeks, Robin Kelly. Education Committee, Bobby Scott, Marsha Fudge, Alma Adams, Lisa Blunt Rochester, and for those who may not be familiar with this programmatic request season, it really is a frenzied <laughs> um, process where letters are circulated around members of Congress office asking for signatories. And the, the weight of those, level, uh, those letters bear heavy in the minds of the appropriators. So if you can call your members of Congress, um, various representatives, and ask them to look out for a YALI letter asking for programmatic support from Congress. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, my boss is not on the Appropriations Committee, so I'm unfamiliar as to whom han who handles that letter um, in the 115th Congress, but for the 116th Congress, uh, we, we shall see, given the new composition and uh, majority change. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Tundi Anitria, who the managing director for the Potomac Group, uh, uh, was part of the uh, trade and investment piece, which was a fabulous discussion. Uh, Mima, you would have been very happy there. Uh, so, uh, Tundi. All right. Good day, everyone. Um, well, I'm the last speaker, and Mel has already given me the warning sign. So, it's, yeah, before I start, so I actually thought of just tweeting a couple of things, but uh, I'll. Um, <laughs> Most of the comments I'm going to make, or most of the issues we touched on during our discussion on trade and investment have actually been covered all day today, all this morning, starting from when um, Congresswoman, Bass, Congresswoman Bass was here. So I'll just touch on three things. First of all, we had a very rich discussion. We had representation from uh, Wall Street, from the venture capital world, from private equity investors, um, we from the diplomatic corps. 
and from uh, uh, civil society. And the overarching themes I think that we can talk, to talk about, one is how do we help to improve the business environment generally in Africa? And, and that's starting from, you know, advising governments on the regulatory environment, on improving regulations, making it easier to register a business, making it easier to, um, to transact, making it easier to, uh, to get money out. Um, how do we provide, how do uh, American institutions, which, which I include private and public, help to provide uh, financing to SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, which are the core of the, of the local economies? Um, and then how do we uh, get some more access to finance for those SMEs and more access to affordable finance? Because there is access to finance, but it's just very expensive. Um, and the various, various ways of doing that, um, I think the, the, uh, the new institution that's been created uh, here, uh, I think there are very, various ways of shaping that to work very closely with um, uh, other entities like the African Development Bank, International Finance Corporation, to help to effect some of these, um, these uh, uh, policies. The second one is how do we get more um, American businesses involved in general? And that's been touched on during the day, and that's really down to information. You know, how do you get information about partners on the ground, local partners in Africa, how do you get that information to companies that are here, and not just the large multinationals who have their own networks, but to small and medium-sized enterprises? And the various mechanisms of doing that that are suggested, you know, working with uh, investment promotion agencies, working with uh, um, with organization, diaspora organizations here, and many of those uh, points have already been discussed during the day. The third part is. Um, how do you get more capital, more American capital involved? Now, there's already a quite an encouraging amount of capital that's looking at Africa from here. Um, on the large, with, 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 for large projects, I mean, you've got institutional investors as an organization here in DC, I think National Association of Investment Professionals, which uh, comprises African Americans who are involved with large institutional investors who are managing billions of dollars. And there's an initiative which they've already started um, implementing to take them to the continent, meet with pension funds locally, and try to figure out how to collaborate in terms of releasing large amounts of capital into larger projects. Um, on the venture capital side, I was at the IFC for many years and worked on venture capital, and I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, to see that there are already a large core of private individuals here in the US and the Northeast who are looking at funding technology companies in Africa and who are just going up on their own. The question is then, how do, we, how do we help to expand that universe? And again, I would say that this new entity here, the DFC, also private sector companies in New York for the most part, um, and in Boston can get involved in terms of spreading information about what they're doing. So the guys who were on my panel, you know, spreading information about what they're doing in venture capital and private equity, and then um, uh, um, helping to get information about projects, projects and investee potential companies that they could invest in on the ground, how to get them that information. And I think the mechanisms are there already, or the institutions are there already. It's a question of creating channels from these institutions. Those were the three things. The, uh, the last topic, which was discussed on a separate panel, but on the same day, was about China. Um, you know, is how do you counteract China? And the belief was you don't really counteract China. If, you, if, you're, if you're encouraging investments from here, um, but sensible, responsible investments, then things will take their course naturally. Um, what what the, whatever the negative aspects of what China is doing in Africa will become more apparent as there are more examples of positive deals that are going you know that are coming into the continent, and associated with that is helping African governments to negotiate good deals, uh, governments and private sector companies to negotiate deals not just with China but with Brazilians, with Americans, with Indians, with everybody else. I think that's very important because if you've got a culture of transparency where people can see what the, the terms are of the, of the transactions you're, you're negotiating, how that's going to impact the local population, local businesses, then I think you're going to be 
you're going to be encouraged or, or you know, to be di very disciplined about that. And there are some initiatives within the African Development Bank that are providing legal support to governments when they're involved in negotiations on large infrastructure projects um, with you know, either other, other multinationals or, or with other sovereigns like China or Brazil or India. And I think that's very important because if a government can, doesn't have to think about how much we, we have um, to pay lawyers or to pay you know, good quality advisors who can help us through these negotiations, then they, they, they're at liberty to then hire the right people to help them through those transactions. And then the product you get at the end of it is a more responsible one.